A Michigan defender says that he can feel the other team's will breaking. All kinds of boa constrictor activity in Ann Arbor. So let's talk about that. Jim Harbaugh discusses the contract negotiations. We seem to have a little more clarity as far as timeline. James Franklin goes out and decides that he's going to kind of step in it a little bit in terms of Michigan. We'll talk about it on this episode of Locked On Wolverines. You are Locked On Wolverines. Your daily podcast on the Michigan Wolverines, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Happy Tuesday. We're back and doing it. Locked On Wolverines podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. I am your man on the ground, Isaiah Hole, publisher of Wolverines Wire through USA Today Sports Media Group. Uh, getting a little tired of being, a, well, not on the ground, on the road. Uh, but nonetheless, we are, we are working to get back to normal. Uh, as far as everything is concerned here. Uh, and speaking of normal, Michigan is just wearing teams out. Third straight year, it seems. Mason Graham out there saying some stuff about uh, what when we can feel opposing offenses tap out. You can see it happening defensively. I, I said this on Sunday. I feel like this is unlike things that we've seen from Michigan in recent memory. Uh, I do want to discuss that a little bit, and I decided suddenly that there's other stuff I want to pull up, so we're going to pull that up in the meantime. But Mason Graham said that, yeah, we can feel their will breaking. Says, like, it's all about practice, right? The things that they do on State Street that turn over to Main Street. This is old-school Michigan in the sense of things are more difficult for them in practice, so they go out in the games, even against Minnesota, even against... Uh, Nebraska having played the scout team and are like, okay, this is easy. This is what we've been waiting for all along, right? Jim Harbaugh, when he came in 2015, the thought was this was going to change to that in a hurry. And it took a lot longer, but it's still continuing and it's still going on. And uh, I, I think that it's pretty amazing that it's happening. So I know a lot of you are probably not impressed. And certainly if you are a... Uh, Rabble fan, you're not impressed at all going to Nebraska and winning 45-7, to Minnesota 52-10, especially if you're a Buckeye fan because that's the way that Ohio State has tended to uh, to beat teams uh, regardless of where they are. But Michigan has not been, right? So let's even just look last year at Michigan's road games. The most lopsided road game that Michigan had all year long. Well, well actually two. Rutgers with 52-17. to They poured on in the second half. Um, but the most lopsided road game was, aside from Rutgers, was Ohio State because they won by uh, 22 points. Uh, they beat Indiana by 21 points. They beat Iowa by 13 points. So, I mean, the the Iowa and Indiana games in the early going, 27-14, 31-10, that's kind of what you expected from Michigan on the road. 2021, kind of similar. Uh, in that, uh, look, look at the road, the road games, Wisconsin didn't end up being a good Wisconsin team, but 38, 17, Nebraska wasn't a good Nebraska team, 32, 29 lost to Michigan state on the road, Penn state, 21, 17, then Maryland came along in 59 to 18, but finally kind of like breaking through that against, I mean, I don't know how good Maryland was, but I mean, you can just go through all of the Jim Harbaugh era, uh, lost to Wisconsin in 2019. Uh, lost to Penn State uh, and uh, beat Indiana 39-14 in a game that felt like a demolition. But now we would look at that score and be like, well, what happened with Michigan, right? 2018, continuing on the road, loses to Notre Dame, three-point win over Northwestern, beats Michigan State 21-7, beats Rutgers, a uh, bad Rutgers team, 42-7, to last Chris Ash game, I believe, lost on the road to Ohio State, 2017. 28 to 10 against Purdue. I know there was the injury and everything. 27 20 uh, against Indiana, overtime game. Lost to Penn State. Lost to Wisconsin. Beats Maryland 35 to 10. Not a good Maryland team. We'll, we'll stop at 2016 just because I've hammered the point home. Beat Rutgers in the most incredibly amazing way 78 to nothing. Again, that's Rutgers. Beats Michigan State, a team that they were much better than in the 3 and 9 season, 32 to 23. Michigan State certainly kind of storms back a little bit, but nonetheless, lose at Iowa, lose at Ohio State. So note that when Michigan's gone on the road and played, I mean, 
any non Rutgers or Maryland team, which I think don't really count because the, they only now are starting to look like Big Ten teams. They would win just kind of like ho hum, right? I mean, even even Northwestern in uh twenty nine or twenty eighteen, not necessarily super impressive. But now you're just seeing a different Michigan team, right? Like we've gone through all these years. I understand Nebraska and Minnesota, not great. But nonetheless, Michigan has always played down to competition on the road in particular. They've played differently at home, and so far they're playing differently on the road. They've talked about how much that they've wanted to go and just dominate a place. And I'm seeing it as someone who's been to most of these road games going all the way back to 2015. Went to the last two in 2015. I've only missed, I think, uh, three since then. Rutgers 2018. Maryland in 2017. Actually, I think that's all I've missed <clears throat> are those two. So <clears throat> Michigan is just, they're playing at a different level and you can feel it when you're there. Sorry, I'm losing my voice briefly. You can feel it when you're there, right? It, it's, it's no longer just kind of like, oh, now they're starting to pull away. It, it's this instantaneous, you, you know, and you can feel the crowd just taken out like touchdown Michigan. J.J. McCarthy to Roman Wilson, touchdown Michigan, Blake Corum, you know, what, and, and just you feel the deflation, at least in the last two games, in a way that I've never felt us other than being at Rutgers or Maryland, which is impressive. I don't care how bad Nebraska or Minnesota is. The old Michigan would play down to their level, and they're not doing that anymore, and that's amazing. All right. Let's just call that for what it is. Let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about Jim Harbaugh's contract situation uh, because he talked about it. There's been follow-ups. I didn't, I didn't reach out to my boy <laughs> before I didn't get the follow-up. I don't expect that anyway. But we're, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Then we're going to talk about uh, James Franklin and his cockamamie, what have you. So let's do that here in just a moment. But now is the time for your game changer of the week brought to you by Athletic Brewing Company. Much like Will Johnson, Athletic Brewing Company has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. They make non-alcoholic beers that actually taste good. Now, uh, Will Johnson, it took all of, what, 14 seconds for him to put his stamp on the game. First interception of the season comes out. Bates, Ethan Kaliak Manis into throwing the ball right to him. Takes it back to the house. Suddenly... Minnesota, who had knew they probably had no shot against Michigan, learned within 14 seconds that they had no shot against Michigan. Thank you to Will Johnson. Athletic Brewing Company has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. Their brews are great tasting and award winning and beat out full strength beers in global competitions. They brew over 50 styles of craft and non-alcoholic beer, including IPAs, Golden Sours and more. And no hangovers ever. That's the best part. You can find Athletic Brewing, Athletic Brewing Company's non-alcoholic brews at a store near you, or you can buy online at Athletic Brewing Company, sorry, athleticbrewing.com. First-time customers can use the code Locked On to get 15% off of your first online order. That's Locked On at checkout for 15% off at athleticbrewing.com. Near beer, exclusions and conditions apply. Athletic Brewing Company, fit for all times. All right, so Jim Harbaugh discussed his contract situation. Kind of finally, here's some of the things that he had to say about it. Let's go to, not the tape, but just what he had to say. Kind of going back here. Okay, maybe I maybe I went back a little too far. I did. Um, had it right up here. Here we go. Asked how amenable he would be doing a contract. It says, like anybody, you want to be somewhere where you're wanted what they like, what you do and how you do it. And then they tell you that your boss is telling you that and it gets reflected in a contract. But yeah, bottom line, any of us, right? I mean, that's what we want to, we want to be, excuse me, somewhere where they like how you do it and what you do. Asked again about it before I awkwardly asked about Indiana. He said, it's been a three and a half year thing uh, about what it is as far as any insurances or anything. So yeah, especially gets put into a contract. I mean, I can't say that any more clearly and definitely open to that. Like I've shown through, through the years, but it's like anybody, man, I'm just like concentrating and focusing 
on having a good practice today. Got a team meeting coming up. We got practices. It's coach the team time when you're in the middle of the season. And then Ward Manuel told uh, a couple different people who reached out to him that, hey, you know, yeah, we're hoping to get this done before too long here. Like, we're going to make him the highest paid coach in the Big Ten. So I think now, I mean, I, I don't want to say I think now, but I mean, this is going to continue on until we get to the point where he's signed, sealed, and delivered. And then the, the rumors will still happen, right? It'll still be like, man, he's just got such a connection to the Jacksonville Jaguars. I mean, he's he's been to Florida before and just loves it there. And, you know, it, it, his wife has connections to Trevor Lawrence and all that kind of stuff that happens all of the time. And, uh, yeah, so we're going to continue on having that, of course. I mean, that's not going to ha- go anywhere. I mean, he's 60 years old. You know, it just it, it doesn't really feel like he's going to leave for the NFL. I know people are going to try to will it into an existence every single year. Uh, I mean, he it's part of, partly of his own making by flirting with the NFL the last two years. Now, last year made a lot of sense, right? Like, I've, I, if you watch or listen to the show, I've told you. He was doing that to, to get some leverage for NIL and for uh, the transfer portal and all of the different changing things in the landscape of college football. And I think he... He got what he needed out of that. At least, I, you know, he, he thought he did at that time. And that's when Santa Ono sw- swooped in and, and said, hey, we're, we're going to make sure that he is a, uh, that he's a dude here forever. Um, I mean, I, I know that, that there's always the talk about him and Ward Manuel and any kind of animosity there. I, I just think that's way overblown for the most part. I, I'm not saying that there hasn't been at some times. It, you know, it's kind of the same as the 2020, the animosity between him and Mark Schlissel. He didn't depart after that. Certainly, if he was going to leave, not that he would have had a lot of suitors after 2020. I mean, that would have been the year. Someone would have taken a flyer on him in the NFL. And yet he stayed. He stood pat, right? He didn't change. He just, just was like he was back and, you know, revamped everything with his uh, reworked contract that didn't look pretty and didn't feel good. But yes, now is the time for Michigan to say, we really appreciate you. And they should do it before they, they move on to, uh, to do bigger and better things. Because at that point, yes, it does become too late, right? It, it does become a, hey, yeah, you made the college football playoff again. Maybe you won the national championship or whatever. Uh, so now we're going to reward you after year three of this upward trajectory. No, I don't think that that's worth doing. I think if you look at the first three games of the season and see the difference between them not having Jim Harbaugh and having Jim Harbaugh, you need to keep having Jim Harbaugh. That seems pretty evident. So it, it's pretty, pretty imperative, I think, for Michigan to finish this out, get it done, and then move on. And certainly there's still going to be talk. There's still going to be people trying to make things out of whatever, you know. Yeah, he's always wanted to coach in the the uh, the Philippine Football League. He he saw Philippines on a map, and he's just it's it's always been a dream of his to to go over to Manila and make some things happen. You know, there's always going to be that talk. That's never going away. It, it's been every year except for 2020, the one year in which him leaving Michigan was the most justified. But it's it's never going to go away. So you just have to deal with it. But at the, if you're Michigan, make it so. It's obvious he's not going anywhere. Five years, seven years, I don't know, about 10 years. That seems like a lot. Give him, give him five or seven years guaranteed, 10 million a year. Make him feel good. Make him feel wanted. Make him, make him retire a Michigan football coach. If you reassess when he's 67, cool. <laughs> you know, 67, I think he'll probably coach beyond then. But, you know, make it... Make, make him say, put it in, in writing and in paper, just the same way as he said, I'm done with my NFL dalliance. Make that, make that a reality. That's up to Michigan to do. All right. Not apparently very talkative today. So we're just going to move on and we're going to discuss James Franklin, what he had to say, what I have to say about it. I've got more to say on that for sure. So we'll do that here in just a moment. Before we do, passion, drive, and patience, what brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. 
From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. That's because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. All right, let's, uh, because I keep on clicking on Windows, things keep going away, but here we go. James Franklin, Frames Jenklin, out there talking his talk. There's a team in this conference that's buying out a ton of game contracts to go in another direction. You got to do whatever you possibly can to give yourself a chance to be undefeated. Gee, I wonder who he's talking about. There's only, you know, Ohio State's not doing it. That's your other impediment. So uh, that's something that he decided to say. Uh, clearly about Michigan. I understand you had that that home and home with Auburn. I mean, Auburn was, they were crazy, right? I mean, let's just, let's just take a moment to just extol what 2022 Auburn was. They were... Uh, they were five and seven. Wow. <laughs> Heck of a team. Auburn in uh, 2021, six and seven. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's difficult. James frames, whatever you want to call you. I like James Franklin. I do. Uh, in a personal level, he's always been very nice to me and I've had no less than five interactions with him. Uh, I, and, and when I say interactions, I, I, I have le legitimately talked to him one-on-one -on -one multiple times and I've always found him very affable, but sometimes he says and does things that require a little bit of, I don't, I guess ridicule be something. So let's take this moment. Now that James Franklin's out there discussing his non-conference schedule or Michigan's non-conference schedule, they bought out of two games. The UCLA home and home. So that affected last year and this year. They have Texas, Oklahoma, now going to be SEC schools, both on the schedule. They've got Notre Dame on the schedule way in advance. They had Washington on the schedule. Now Washington's permanently a part of the schedule thanks to the, uh, the Big Ten and all of that. Um, Michigan's not exactly shying away and hasn't shied away from uh, having some big games. So before I get into... Uh, the other thing I want to get into, let's just take a look and see. So Michigan, no one of note, no power five teams each of the last two years. They had Washington two years ago, uh, 2020. They were go also going to have Washington, uh, the year before that, that two years before that they had Notre Dame. They also had SMU, which is, you know, now a power, going to be a power five team and wasn't, but was still considered a hard out. Uh, they had Florida. In 2017, also uh, Cincinnati and Air Force, which aren't exactly teams you know, always that you really want to face. They had Colorado, which uh, didn't look like they were going to be much of anything, but they were ranked, right? They finished ranked in 2016. They had Utah and Oregon State and BYU. And we'll throw UNLV in there. And in 2015, they had Utah and Notre Dame in 2014. Um, they had... Uh, Notre Dame in 2013 at UConn, which was at, you know, at the time of the scheduling seemed like a tough one. They had Alabama in 2012. They had Notre Dame, San Diego State in 2011. I don't even remember that San Diego State game. Wow. Uh, I'm just going back all the way. They had Notre Dame and uh, a bunch of whatever teams, U UConn being the big one in 2010, and they had Notre Dame in 2009. That's going all the way back. So let's let's take a look at Penn State in the James Franklin era, starting in 2014. So they played what was considered to be a bad UCF team. They won by two. Akron, you, uh, a freshly new FBS level UMass. So it wasn't FBS level, I don't believe, at the time that the game was scheduled. And Temple in 2014. In 2015, they 
had Temple again, and they lost to Temple to open up the season. Uh, so there's that. Temple, which is a group of five team. Buffalo, San Diego State, and Army. Arm, I'll give them credit for Army. No one wants to play Army. In 2016, they had Kent State, Pitt. Okay, it's Power 5, but how good is Pitt really? I mean, they, they lost to Pitt, but how good has Pitt ever really been in recent memory? Uh, a close game against Temple. And is that it? 2016 was the last year of... Th- of uh, 2015 was the last year of having multiple... Uh, of, of having eight conference games. 2017, Akron, Pitt, Georgia State. 2018, App State, Pitt, Kent State. 2019, FCS Idaho, Buffalo, and Pitt. 2021, Ball State, Auburn, FCS Villanova. 2022, Ohio, Auburn, Central Michigan. 2023, West Virginia. I'll give them credit for West Virginia, who's 4 and 1 at the moment. FCS Delaware. And upcoming. Vaunted matchup with UMass and Don Brown and the mustaches, the fighting mustaches. Listen, James Franklin, I don't care if you have power five teams. If you have an FCS school on the schedule, you have no right to complain. None. None. If you have FCS and UMass, you still have no right to complain. <laughs> Like, okay, you got West Virginia on the schedule. Good for you. You got you got a tenth game in there. It, I'm sorry. Two of your two of your opponents are worse than any of the three that Michigan played. And is West Virginia pretty good? Yeah, it's pretty good. At the moment. Neil Brown needs to figure some things out, right? But come on, man. Just let let the play on the field talk. I know you love to talk. You love to say things. It's not like Michigan's out there just kind of skating by. They're they're destroying teams. They're absolutely destroying teams. So, why don't you take a look at yourself? Take the take the log out of your eye before you try to fix the fleck in Michigan's, and understand that. Uh, understand that you. Just because you played West Virginia this year, because you played an SEC team that ended up not being any good each of the last two years, you ain't nothing, man. You just aren't. It, it's one thing if you're like, man, you know, we played a top 10 team and then we had to go and play another top 25 team. No, you played an FCS team and you're going to play UMass. Like the UMass coaches don't even think UMass is good. So let's just. Simmer down now. Michigan's going to have to play you. Michigan's going to have to play Ohio State just like you. And it will be settled on the field. It doesn't really matter. And guess what? Michigan's going to have to play UCLA before too long anyway. Just because they canceled one series doesn't suddenly make them, because they wanted more home games, because otherwise they weren't going to have a lot of home games the one year, doesn't mean that they're trying to make the playoff because of it. All right. All right. That's going to do it for us today. Tomorrow, Wednesday, we're going to be back at an earlier time, thankfully, uh, because we have Nicole Auerbach from The Athletic joining us, and we'll talk. And she is a Michigan alumna. We are going to discuss the state of Michigan football as she sees it um, and just kind of the breadth of college football as well. She is excellent at uh, evaluating. Uh, I I love following her on Twitter and just everything with, with that. So. We will talk to you then. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Peace.